the fullness of the gospel in the Book of Mormon has yet to be accepted and 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 um, allowed to just be turned loose to set people free and change the whole uh, landscape of where we're at in our relationship with God. That is that's yet to happen. Here we have the Book of Mormon. We have these these prophecies that have been preserved. They didn't get handed down and altered and word of mouth changed over thousands of years. They were safe and secure in the ground and came forth, you know, just a couple hundred years ago. You know, so there hasn't been hardly anything happened to them in terms of changes. And we've they've been some changes, but we were able to get the original stuff. And and yet here we are, this church, you know, the, the people receive this Book of Mormon. And what's the first thing that we do? We start piling on other doctrines that are not found in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, I think in some ways, um, the people, the the House of Israel was protected a little bit, you know, because we didn't take it to them. You know, we we don't want it to go to them in a in a in a twisted, Altered. impure <laughs> form. Yeah, we want it to go in the the pure love of Christ and, and the simple, true gospel found simply in the book as as written, not not some you know interpretation of us, a Gentile version of it. Welcome back to Restore Gospel Podcast. We're two friends having casual conversation about the things of eternity, and we welcome you into that conversation. We have been uh, reading through the Book of Mormon, and we are in uh, First Nephi, right at Nephi's vision, uh, as he asked to see the things that his father had shared. So if you haven't listened to those, back up a couple episodes, and that'll take you to the beginning. But we're going to pick up here in this vision. Well, so... Verse 117 says um, that they are righteous forever because of their faith in the Lamb of God. Their garments are made white in his blood. And the angel saith unto me, look. And I looked and beheld three generations did pass away in righteousness. Their garments were white, even like unto the Lamb of God. And the angel said unto me, these are made white in the blood of the Lamb because of their faith in him. And I, Nephi, also saw many of the fourth generation which did pass away in righteousness. And it came to pass that I saw the multitudes of the earth gathered together. And the angel said unto me, Behold thy seed and the seed of thy brethren. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the people of my seed gathered together in multitudes against the seed of my brethren. And they were gathered together in battle. And the angel spake unto me, saying, Behold the fountain of filthy water which thy father saw, yea, even the river, of which he spake, and the depths thereof are the depths of hell. And the mists of darkness are the temptations of the devil, which blindeth the eyes and hardeneth the hearts of the children of men and leadeth them away into broad roads that they perish and are lost. Uh, In a large and spacious building, which thy father saw, is vain imaginations and the pride of the children of men. And a great and terrible gulf divideth them, yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God and Jesus Christ, which is the Lamb of God, of whom the Holy Ghost beareth record from the beginning of the world until this time and from this time henceforth and forever. That um, that verse 127 talks about the sword of the justice of the eternal God. Mm -hmm. That was changed after the first edition of the Book of Mormon. And uh, we had in earlier classes, I think Corey taught, talked about the sword of justice and its reoccurring theme and what it means for God uh, to bring down that sword of justice. So to change that to something different um, takes away from really the pattern in the scripture, which talks about that sword of justice. Right. Yeah. That, uh, that, that, I don't know, understand what, what their thought process for changing that would have been. Um, this theme of justice and mercy is something that is just really powerful in the Book of Mormon. Um, I, I found a scripture earlier today that I that I that really stood out. Um, you know, the Book of Mormon. I mean, the uh, the vision. It talks about that justice being the pride of the world. You know, that the, there's this big separation between the pride of the world and the the tree, and uh, between the love of God. 
And I, I, I find it really fascinating if you, if you read this a little bit closer in Alma 19, 95 to 97, it talks about this justice of God. And it says, um, and it might be worth pulling up, Mike, if you can get to you it. Go ahead and read it. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Alma 19, 95. It says, now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. And so I was doing some pondering today about this. And so justice is like a baseline standard of who God is. You know, it's a cause effect situation. So if, you know, if I, um, if I go next door and shoot my neighbor, there's going to be some justice. Now his wife can choose not to, you know, press charges or whatever, but there'll be justice upon me unless I receive mercy. Um, with God, you know, it's the same way with God. There's a, there's an immediate effect to our choices. There's, you know, there, he has to respond to, um, I don't know. I'm not saying this very well, but there's like this, there is this separation that happens between God and man when we allow sin to enter in. And so this says, now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would cease to be God. And thus we see that all mankind were fallen and they were in the grasp of justice. Yea, the justice of God, which consigned them forever to be cut off from his presence. And now the plan of mercy, and this is, this is what stood out to me today. So the word plan Planning requires a decision, requires thought, and you know it's a, it's an action. God took action to have mercy upon us, whereas justice is something that just happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it says, and now the plan of mercy could not be brought about except an atonement should be made. Therefore, God Himself atoneth for the sins of the world to bring about the plan of mercy to appease the demands of justice. So. When you're talking about the plan, because it, there's a there's a decision, there's an action involved. That love of God for His people made this plan where of mercy, where we had an opportunity to make it back to Him. Whereas justice is something that even God has to to abide by. I mean, He it's His own law, it's His own. Um, I guess He's He's bound by His own character, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it says to appease the man's justice that God might be a perfect just God and a merciful God also. So God could choose to, to just allow justice to take his course and he would still be God, but he he made a decision. He chose mercy. And so when you, when you look back at that, in these, at the vision or, you know, the scripture, we're talking about the sword of justice, even the sword of justice of the eternal God, this is in one twenty seven, and a great and terrible gulf divided them. Yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God and Jesus Christ, which is the lamb of God, of whom the Holy Ghost bears record from the beginning of the world and this time, and from this time henceforth and forever. It was Jesus Christ, by taking the form of Jesus Christ, by him, by God himself atoning, by taking that form in flesh, was a conscious decision by God to express his love for mankind by showing us mercy. Whereas justice would have just happened on its own. I don't, I don't know if I'm I saying like it very that. well, but yeah. Well, I haven't heard it explained that way before, and that adds another another layer of understanding. Um, yeah. The action that's taken versus automatic. The automatic uh, result of our actions is justice, and the plan being played out as mercy takes takes action, I guess, or um, not automatic action, but uh, like you said, him taking on flesh and blood. Yeah. Potential, yeah, yeah. Potential action, yeah. That's so, really cool. That's I, I like that. It has I haven't heard that explained that way before. Well, good, yeah. good for you, Shane. Doing some teaching today. <laughs> yeah. So basically, he sees ro- the the war, ro- wars among his brethren, and that plays out throughout the Book of Mormon. And it says that after they had dwindled in unbelief in one thirty four, they became a dark and loathsome people, a filthy people full of idleness and all manner of abominations. And he's going to now he's, he's getting into this prophecy basically of America and what happens here you know, all the way up into our day, I believe, because the angel tells Nephi to look in verse 135. Um, and what does he ask him? He beholds Shane, many kingdoms, nations. Yeah. I lost my spot here. Um, uh... Yeah, he says, saith unto me, these are the kingdoms, the nations and kingdoms of the Gentiles. Okay. 
So Nephi's seen these Gentile nations, kings, and within them comes this formation of a great church in verse 139. We talk about this a lot, but what is this church doing to, you think of a church as being a good thing made up of people that go to worship God, um, but what is this church uh, is called most abominable above all other churches? And look at some of the things it's doing to the saints. It slayeth the saints of God, it tortureth them, it bindeth them down, and yoketh them with a yoke of iron, and bringeth them down into captivity. And what's what's the prophecy say here about, about the Gentiles and the waters? It came to pass that I looked and beheld the many waters, and they divided the Gentiles from the seed of my brethren. And it came to pass that the angel saith unto me, Behold, the wrath of God is upon the seed of thy brethren. And I looked and beheld a man among the Gentiles, which were separated from the seed of my brethren by the many waters. And I beheld the Spirit of God that it came down and wrought upon the man, and he went forth upon the many waters, even unto the seed of my brethren, which were in the promised land. Um, what do you think? So this I just read this today, 147. I, As we read about the Spirit of God being upon a man, And he went forth upon the waters, even unto the seed of my brethren, which were in the promised land. What um, what have you been taught or what have you thought that that refers to? Well, I've always been I've always assumed it was it was Columbus. Yeah. Yeah. Just today I was reading. And it's interesting. The article I was reading was talking about Columbus and it said there was a comment in there that said, Christopher Columbus didn't discover America. America discovered Christopher Columbus. <laughs> and it was, uh, I'll put a link. It's from a um, uh, website's called bookofmormonism.com. Um, and the article talks about because of the prophecies of the Book of Mormon. And if you look at some of those, and, and we can go into this deeper at another time. I won't go too far into it today. But I didn't know this. I thought, I always wondered, like, how could it be Christopher Columbus, you know, if if the Book of Mormon took place up here in in the land of America, because it it describes there not being any kings among them and then flourishing and prospering. It seems to describe the United States as opposed to South or Central America. Um, How do you tie christopher columbus into that because i thought he went to like central america or somewhere he never even set foot on the americas no he didn't (laughs) he went to the islands and named them for christian names like trinidad and for the trinity and and those names but he didn't set foot on america yeah so so yeah i i read that article too and i there's some really really interesting points that he made uh one that i kind of stood out was you know, we've turned Christopher Columbus into the guy that discovered, discovered America. Now, we, we've proven that that's not necessarily true. There were other people, Leif Erikson and other people that had come out here before him. Um, but they, we just kind of typically labeled him as the guy that did it. Um, and, and not to take anything away from what he did or what he discovered. But the thing is, is, you know, we at the time that this was at, the, at these histories were being written, we were bitter enemies with Britain. We didn't want anything to do with, with, the, with Britain. I mean, they were our enemy. We wanted freedom from them. And so we were looking for, now this is according to this article I read. I, I haven't looked all the sources up, but we were looking for a, a hero basically that was not British. You know, we, we didn't, we weren't looking, we weren't wanting a, a, a kind of a British guy to be one of our founding, you know, whatever fathers or whatever. Um, so we get a guy who's who's from Spain, who is having trouble with this, his king and queen, just like we were with with Great Britain, and you know we sort of turn him into this this hero, and and then for us, and that and that's just in our culture as our na- in our nation, and then if you apply that to the church, we we think in terms, I mean, we always think culturally. You know, if you say who's the hero that came over and discovered America, well, your first thought is, you know, col- you know. Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, you know, I right. mean, we, we go back to our, our education and our culture. Um, but this article brought up some really interesting points and go ahead. If you had something prepared for it. 
No, just that in early uh, folklore or, or early uh, colonial history, this was a symbol. This was Columbia, the woman in the white dress, that that spirit of pioneership and, you know, the new country emerging. And this was kind of cool. He had, uh, you've probably all seen this, Columbia Pictures. Um, there she is. And later, I guess, the Statue of Liberty took over kind of as the icon for America. But um, I didn't ever know where this came from. I've seen this a hundred times, you know, in movies. But the whole Columbia was, um, the spirit of Columbia was behind Columbus. And as you said, uh, looking for kind of a, a personality separate from, from Britain. So when you get into the prophecies, then it takes on a different, kind of a little different shape and, I hope to go. We'll go into that at a later date. Um, but that's, uh, I'll put a link. You can read the article. It's uh, bookofmormonism.com. Well, one thing that I thought was really profound about it, what makes me kind of lean that direction now as I, as I read about it, is, you know, if you really know the, the, the promises that are on this land of America, um, you know, the initial one was made with the brother Jared, you know, that, that if they would be righteous, they would possess this land, and anybody that's not righteous will be swept off this land. That then that happened to them; they got swept off. So then they got replaced basically right away by the Nephites and the Lamanites, and that same promise was given to Lehi: if you if your posterity will be righteous, they'll possess this land. They won't have kings. They'll be prosperous. They'll 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 do wonderful, and they didn't they failed and the nephites the nephites were swept off by the lamanites and the lamanites you know just about got swept off by by us <laughs> you know the white man came in and drove them drove them off the land living in in the on the reservations and so you've got this little handful of lamanites that are left over as a remnant and and only because god preserved them you know that was the prophecy that he would preserve a a, a, a part of his seed and then you've got the gentiles now Facing the same thing, we're on this covenant land. Well, so if you apply that to who has come over from England, who who come over to establish this country, you know, you don't find those kind of covenants with uh, uh, Columbus. You know, and he was he was a good man, but he was looking to gather wealth to fight a war to take back Jerusalem. That was where yeah, he, was, he was. Yeah, that was what I didn't hear until today. That's interesting because he was a Christian. And he wanted to spread Christianity, but he was also believed in Armageddon and that the imminent return of Jesus was coming, right? And so right. somehow they had to get control because everything in their belief system was it was going to transpire around Israel and Jerusalem. That was going to be the, the center of the, of the whole last battle and the return of Jesus and everything. Everything biblical was going to happen there. So what did, he wanted to, what, go find gold and spices and wrote to the, to the countrymen we're, we're going to have 50,000 soldiers or 5,000 horses. And we can go, t go kick the Muslims out of Israel, Jerusalem mm -hmm. and take the city back so that we can prepare for Jesus to come. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So his, you know, his motivation for this land, he was not looking for a land of promise. He wasn't looking for a place where he could, he could worship God in, in, in freedom. And he was looking to, to cash in as a payday for him. And but so then so then you say, OK, well, who who was looking for a land of religious freedom where they could worship God and truly make a covenant with God and and live on the land, not just strip it of its gold and take it back somewhere else. And the Puritans fit that exam fit that exactly, you know, and the, the Mayflower, the Mayflower Compact was actually a covenant that they made. And it, some of the wording even matches the same wording, you know, that, you know, this land will be preserved for, you know, for your first generations. I can't remember all the wording, but it's very similar to the covenant that Nephi was under, that Lehi was under uh, on this land, promising to God that this land would be dedicated to him and his work and his glory. And uh, they even talked about building the new Jerusalem. And I mean, they, they really, they saw themselves as like house of Israel being freed from the bondage of, of England um, and coming here for, for, for religious freedom. And so um, in that paper, he talks about John Elliott, who was, who was, and interestingly enough, John Elliott was a huge uh, missionary to the Indians. Um, 
he actually is the first person to interpret the Bible into their native language. And so, you know, and he, he shared, you know, he, he was here for, I think, 14 or 15 years, he learned their language. You know, it took him for a long time to get that Bible translated. And so, you know, he was spreading what as much of the gospel that he had available to him at that time. And so when it talks about them bringing over a book, the mm -hmm. Gentiles bringing a book, here's this guy, he's a Puritan. He brings them the Bible and he interprets it in their language, you know? And so, and it talks about the Gentiles book. And so I really feel like it, it may, that may, he may be right. This may be who, who the scripture is talking about, not necessarily Columbus because of our traditions, you know? And it came to pass, I beheld the spirit of God that it wrought upon other Gentiles and they went forth out of captivity upon the many waters. I don't know that they understood or certainly they didn't have a clue um, <laughs> that they'd been prophesied of back in the Book of Mormon. But they they so they, they were they were they were fulfilling prophecy and certainly didn't know it at the time, at least in that aspect. But yeah, I don't think they knew they were fulfilling this prophecy, obviously, but uh, I think that no. they. I think that they did know that God was, was, was guiding them um, mm -hmm. because they give him credit when things happen, you know, when, when they have, when they're say, when the, you know, the Indians helped them survive, things like that, they credit God for it and, and thank God for it. You know, I think they were a, a devout people. Um, and even though their doctrines. Which, yeah. That, Thanksgiving's tomorrow. So yeah, exactly. Uh, recording this a day before. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so this, this seems to, um, be pretty straightforward here. Uh, I beheld many multitudes of Gentiles upon the land of promise, and I beheld the wrath of God that was upon the seed of my brethren, and they were scattered before the Gentiles, and they were smitten. And I beheld the Spirit of the Lord that it was upon the Gentiles, that they did prosper and obtain the land for their inheritance. And I beheld that they were white and exceedingly fair and beautiful, like unto my people before they were slain. Um, as we talk about the, the, the poor plight that befalls the, the Lamanites, the remnants of Lehi being smitten and scattered by these white, fair Gentiles, it, it, was, uh, it was on my heart. I don't know if it was this week or last week I brought it up to you. Just this overwhelming aha moment, not that it was new to me, but just a realization that if God's coming at people and those that he, he tried to start his work with and bless the world with, and because of what they did, he allowed them to suffer, you know, through Germany and the Nazis and be scattered on this land by the Gentiles. If he allowed all of that to happen to his covenant people, what happens when the Gentiles reject him and his gospel? Are we going to have anything less happen to us? I mean, the story's been, I mean, have you ever gone through, I'm glad I wasn't a Jew, you know, but it's like, <laughs> right. but now you're a Gentile and part of a Gentile nation rejecting God. So welcome yeah. to the, <laughs> the calamity and the prophecy that is, you know, has been held back for those Gentiles that reject. Yeah. It's, it's, it's should be frightening. And, um, well, I think the thing that, that has happened to us in many ways is, is the same thing that happened to Israel. You know, they they thought of themselves as the chosen people. They had been, they had all the wonderful stories. They'd been delivered by by you know out of the hands of Pharaoh, this this mighty, powerful king of the earth. You know, they they had all this incredible testimonies, and they just sat back and thought, well, we're God's chosen people. You know, and and even though God kept having to wake them up over and over, they had to wander around the wilderness for 40 years before they could go into the promised land. And I mean, he just they were just so bullheaded. And I think often we we uh, we refer back to him and we're like, oh, I can't believe they didn't see this. I can't believe they were so dense, you know, and it's so obvious. And and yet you look at us today here. We have the Book of Mormon. We have these these prophecies that have been preserved. They didn't get handed down and altered and word of mouth changed over thousands of years. They were safe and secure in the ground and came forth, you know, just a couple hundred years ago, you know, so there hasn't been hardly anything happened to them in terms of changes. And we've, they've been some changes, but we were able to get the original stuff. And, and yet here we are, this church, you know, the, the people receive this book of Mormon and what's the first thing that we do we start piling on other doctrines that are not found in the Book of Mormon. 
we start going a different direction away from the simple basic truths that are found there. Yeah. And, we're pulling out, we're pulling out certain doctrine and, um, misplacing it, emphasizing it too much or out of place or out of, out of position and what it was meant or just adding on to it, you know, taking something simple. Cause Zion in the new Jerusalem is mentioned in the book of Mormon, but, uh, that's not the main message of the Book of Mormon. It's part of it, but it, it's it's the Holy Ghost dwelling within you and being a changed person. It's the atonement of Christ throughout the the, the right. Lamb of God, the, the fact that you have forgiveness and mercy and uh, ability to come back. And yeah, it's all of those things. You're you're right. So we we pile well, we on. Sought, yeah, we sought for a we sought for an Old Testament style church that was you know full of ordinances and 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 things we could do, physical things that we could do. Um, and, and we got that chosen itis going on, you know, and I'll, I'll speak for myself too. I spent most of my life believing, you know, that I'm in the one true church. Nobody else has the truth that I have. And, and there is this feeling of, you know, I don't need to listen to you because I have the truth, you know? And so you shut people off. You, 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 you won't listen when someone tries to share a, a testimony, you think, well, I, you're not part of the true church, so that can't be real. Right, <laughs> a little, little less, uh, wink, wink. Okay, good for you. Right, yeah, a yeah. Tale relationship with God, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Coincidence. No, right. I get it. So, what happens when the Gentiles reject? So, I woke up this morning, and on my mind, for whatever the thought, the the phrase came through. You know, the Gentiles rejecting the fullness of the gospel, and I flipped it around immediately, and I just, I just thought. Who, when has someone accepted the fullness of the gospel contained in the Book of Mormon? It has yet to be accepted right. um, by a, other than individuals that realize its value and are trying to study it. But as a corporate corporation or a body of people, the Book of Mormon has yet to be accepted. The fullness of the gospel in the Book of Mormon has yet to be accepted and and, and um, allowed to just be turned loose to set people free and change the whole uh, landscape of where we're at in a relationship with God. That is, that's yet to happen. Right. Um, no one has, has just in its purity embraced it and taught it. And yeah, you, it. yeah, you made a really good point, you know, with that. And is that there is name, you can't name, at least I can't name, one organized church, organized church body that has truly embraced the Book of Mormon and taught exclusively its doctrine, you know, revealing it to the world that what, what God has revealed of the people of this continent, you know, you, you just can't do it. I mean, Joseph Smith hardly preached from it. Um, they're, you know, the, the Mormon, the LDS rarely preached from it and they've, they've added all kinds of new doctrines to the, to that process um their lds have added things um the you know really all every faction you can't name any factions that you know that don't they have made that a central feature of their belief system no you would think it sounds it sounds uh, ludicrous on the surface because i know the lds church has, has translated the book of mormon into you know 150 maybe plus languages you can i, I live by the mormon visitor center in independence i walked in there uh, a number of years ago and they had them all laid out on the table. There's just, it's, it's remarkable, right? But that does not mean you've embraced the fullness of the gospel taught in there. Uh, we, we did a series that um, the Book of Mormon is not Mormonism. Uh, the, we as a people and what, what we have practiced as a church has given the Book of Mormon a bad name. But the, the LDS church has not embraced the Book of Mormon. They've embraced Mormonism, but not the, the pure gospel contained in there. And, uh, and we, We've blamed them for a lot from the RLDS side, but things went all the way back to Joseph. You know, as early as 1830, they were given a commandment to take the gospel to the Lamanites. And at that time, their message was, there's going to be a temple and we're going to gather to Zion and you need to come. And I often thought we suffer as a church because we didn't take the Book of Mormon to the Lamanites. But by the time that commandment had come, the switcheroo had already taken place that it wasn't about the doctrine of coming unto Christ and being perfected in him and all of the beautiful teachings we have in the Book of Mormon. It was about 
come to Zion. There's going to be a temple there, and the Lord's coming back soon. Yeah, and that and, was accompanied by by prophecies that said that Zion would be reared up in this generation. You know, and so there was even prophecies that didn't come to pass during that period. So sources are coming for these comments. It's we're working on an episode. So in going through that, we're reading things. But I thought to myself, it wasn't that the church failed to take the gospel to the Lamanites. They were given a, a revelation, so-called revelation to do that. But I just thought this week, that's not the message. I don't that God that we were supposed to take to them. Like the message had already been altered. So why would God provide a way for the remnants of Lehi to come into our Gentile church and have things misappropriated and twisted around where the, the uh, focus isn't on anything close to what it should be. He doesn't want them a part of that. So uh, it's not that we didn't do it. It's that we, we were taking the wrong message already. And so it wasn't going to happen and the way wasn't going to be prepared. Yeah. I That's a new way of looking at things, right? I was, well, we messed up. We should have been taking it to the end. Well, no, we should have learned what the message was first instead of right. taking a false message. Right. Yeah. I think in some ways, um, the people, the, the house of Israel was protected a little bit, you know, because we didn't take it to them. You know, we, we don't want it to go to them in a, in a, in a, twisted <laughs> in pure form yeah we want it to go in the the pure love of christ and, and the simple true gospel found simply in the book as as written not not some you know interpretation of us a gentile version of it look you know? the message of the apostles who spent time with jesus face to face took the gospel out to the gentiles and among the gentiles uh, uh abominable church rose up and perverted it and people suffered it was restored in 1830 or in the 1830s, sorry, the, it was translated before 1830. The simple gospel was available again, and it's in the hands of the Gentiles. Are they going to pure, you know, are they going to accept it and take it in its purity? Or are they going to repeat the pattern? It seems, and, and this is, um, this is not saying that there's consciously people trying to do this, but it's like, we're a victim of, we're a victim of ourselves already uh, early on and not embracing the the true pure message so it's it's kind of gone through it again and, and so god's gonna raise one up among the lamanites to do a work yeah well you know when it's funny because when you look at the bible when it talks about israel he doesn't ever blame one person you know he doesn't say oh moses you messed up or oh aaron you shouldn't have done what you did or whatever it's it's always the group israel you know israel is hard-hearted and israel has failed israel you know did not come unto me. Israel did not want to come in my presence on the mountain, you know? Um, and I think and we can Jesus say that. died for them and he died for every one of them. And they could, they, it doesn't mean they're not going to be in his kingdom with them. Right. It's just that they had experienced their, their own carnal state. And this is what happens and why you need a savior folks. Yeah. 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 It's easy well, to, and I think, uh, go ahead. Yeah. I think you can apply that same sort of thought process to, to us today. The people in Joseph's day, you know, Joseph made mistakes. W.W. Phelps made mistakes. Sidney Ridden made mistakes. You can, you can go through the list of names. They all were either deceived or were at times deceivers, at, at times selfish, at times rude. At time, you know what I mean? You can label a whole bunch of sins on everybody. But the actual membership, the membership are is complicit as the leadership in terms of seeking seeking leadership, looking, looking to someone else rather than having a relationship personally with Christ. Um, not calling out men that, that bring forth false prophecy, you know, and, and, and I know some did and they got excommunicated for it, but you know, they're, uh, the, as a member, I think sometimes we, we want to put responsibility on our leaders. And the reality of it is, is that every single one of us is called to have a relationship with Christ and we are responsible for our spiritual walk with him. And we as a church have not, taught that i don't think like we should have um I, I think it's too easy just to show up on sunday and sit in the pews and listen to a sermon and walk out feeling like that you've you've been fed and yet you 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 may have been fed in that day or may have felt good when you walked out but but the walk with christ the relationship the daily relationship with christ is absolutely necessary or we will fall into the idolatry and we've seen that over and over and over through history yeah we've discussed this that, that is the message the good thing is we have we have the Book of Mormon. We have the message. We have it uh, anywhere we need to 
to get it. We have it in the palm of our hand. We can read those words and uh, interact with, well, the truth is there. It's it's how we interact with it, but it's not, at least it's not hidden up in a vault somewhere without copies where we can read with our own eyes, like, like times past in history. We all have access to these words and to the Holy Spirit to to be in relationship with. So, yep. Well, who knows where we are now? We've gotten off track a little bit, but not really. So back to 153. Okay. I beheld that the mother Gentiles were gathered together upon the waters and upon the land also to battle against them, talking about those in this land. And I beheld that the power of God was with them and also that the wrath of God was upon all those that were gathered together against them to battle. And I, Nephi, beheld that the Gentiles, which had gone out of captivity, were delivered by the power of God out of the hands of all other nations. Which Gentiles, if we're looking at this continent, which Gentiles would you say that is, Shane? Well, who's that talking about? <laughs> that, there's, to me, in my mind, there's no question it's the United States. I mean, we've, right. we have been delivered by the hand of God so many times, you know, by even even having like, um, when the British were invading, there was like a, I believe there was like a tornado or something that hit Washington DC and drove the troops back. And that was the only thing that saved us. And we were totally outnumbered and we totally would have been just conquered. Um, but, but even God's natural, you know, the, the natural forces of nature, um, protected this nation. And there's, there's a reason why we've been so prosperous. It's not because we're so good with money or anything like that, you know? Right. And um, 156 says, I, Nephi, beheld they did prosper in the land. And I beheld a book that was carried forth among them. And the angel said, Knowest the meaning of the book? And I said, I know not. And he said, Behold, it proceeds out of the mouth of a Jew. And I, Nephi, beheld it. So here's this, uh, here's where, you know, like you say, Christopher Columbus doesn't, you know, he didn't bring a book or his his crew didn't bring a book to the, um, to the Indians, to to the tribe over here. You talked about that other man who did, and we we'll get into that later. But for all intents and purposes, the the Puritans and everybody that had come over had a, a belief in God, like you you referenced. Um, they wanted to serve Him. They gave thanks to Him, and it it's the book that we call the Bible, right? The from the Jews. Um. You can read 162 if you want. Okay. Um, well, 161, and, and he saith unto me, The book which thou beholdest is a record of the Jews, which contains the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. And it also containeth many of the prophecies of the holy prophets. And it is a record like unto the engravings which are upon the plates of brass, save there are not so many. Nevertheless, they contain the covenants of the Lord, which he hath made unto the house of Israel. I find that fascinating that the book of the, the uh, brass plates actually had more than what we have in the, in the Bible in terms of the prophecies and, and all that, uh, mm -hmm. at least up to, up to the time of King Zedekiah. And it says, wherefore they are of great worth unto the Gentiles. And the angel of the Lord said unto me, thou hast beheld that the book proceedeth forth from the mouth of a Jew. And when it proceedeth forth from the mouth of a Jew, it contained, it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord of whom the 12 apostles bore record. And they bore record re re according to the truth, which is in the Lamb of God. Wherefore, these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles, according to the truth, which is in God. And after that, they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb from the Jews unto the Gentiles. Behold, after this, thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church, which is the most abominable of all other churches. For I get behold, it. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just going gonna, gonna to back you up here. Um Oh, it was almost, it's almost like thou hast proceeded. Thou hast, okay, 165. Thou beheld that the book proceeds from the mouth of a Jew. And when it proceeded forth from the mouth of the Jew, it contained the fullness of the gospel of the Lord, of whom the 12 apostles bore record. And it's almost like, what if you substitute that in, in the 1800s? Thou sees a book that proceeds forth from the mouth of of your ancestors to the Gentiles. And when it did, it contained the fullness, but it's like the message just got altered a little bit as soon as that happened. 
It says, therefore, these things go from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles, according to the truth which is in God. And after that, you see that church that comes forth. It's just so uh, it's just so evident to me that the pattern reversed itself, like, like uh, in these latter days, this last time. Does mm-hmm. that make does that make sense to you? Though? Yeah. Yep. Well, sorry, continue on. Okay. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away. And all this have they done, that they might pervert the right ways of the Lord, that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore thou seest that after the book hath gone forth through the hands of the great and abominable church, that there are many plain and most precious things taken away from the book, which is the book of the Lamb of God. After that, these plain and precious things were taken away, it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles. And after it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles, yea, even across the many waters which thou hast seen with the Gentiles, which have gone forth out of captivity, and thou seest because of the plain, the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of the book, which were plain unto the understanding of the children of men, according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God. And because of these things, which are taken away out of the gospel of the Lamb, and exceeding great, and many do stumble. Yea, insomuch that Satan hath great power over them. Nevertheless, thou beholdest the Gentiles, which have gone forth out of captivity, and have been lifted up by the power of God above all other nations upon the face of the land, which I don't know of any other nation that would fit that other than the United States. Um, Right. Which is choice above all other lands, which is the land which the Lord God hath covenanted with thy father that his seed should have for the land of their inheritance. Wherefore thou seest that the Lord God will not suffer that the Gentiles will utterly destroy the mixture of thy seed, which is among thy brethren. I think that's the only thing right there that saved the American Indians. I think I think we our 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 bigotry and our our anger towards them would have just continued to go until they were completely wiped out. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, right there, it says that God would not allow us to utterly destroy them. Yeah, this is, these two verses right here are important. Because it, it says the Gentiles have been raised up by the power of God above all other nations upon the face of the land, which is choice above all other lands. And then he says, which is the land which the Lord God hath covenanted with thy father that his seed should have for the land of their inheritance. So even though the Gentiles have been brought here as a for a purpose and have prospered and have been raised up above every other nation in the world, He also tells that this is the land of not the Gentiles, but thy seed for their inheritance. Right. And that's a very, that's a very key connection. um, Important to remember because I think we've been prideful, you know, thinking this is our land. Right. Well, and I think there's only, there's really just two things from keeping this from coming to pass. One the Gentiles will have to take this gospel, this this book, to the Lamanites, and then two, the Lamanites will have to repent. You know, right now they're still under the same condemnation that they had because of their original sin. You know, a couple thousand years ago, you know, and that is that they they turned away from their God, they forgot their God, and so they they got they got swept they got swept off the land, and so but once they accept the Book of Mormon, once they accept the truth, the covenants that God has with them, they'll be restored to the covenant people and they'll blossom as a rose. And that's where, where you and I, and those, those you know, hopefully you and I, those that are righteous, those that are serving God uh, of the among the Gentiles will be adopted in, you know, to that, to that tribe of Israel. Um, and, and that's really, that's the future. Now, we, we don't know when that's going to happen, but that's, according to these scriptures, that's what's going to happen in our future. It's not the Gentile church that's going to build Zion and then also let the let the Native Americans join in. That's not how this goes. And we have we just have read past that all these years in our, in our church culture. Yeah, I think the Book of Mormon, we've talked about it earlier, um, several, several episodes ago, but uh, under the choice here. But I think, I think personally the scriptures say that there'll be one that raises up among the Lamanites that'll do a great work. And he, he will be the one that they listen to the choice seer, not, 
I think the Gentiles' time has passed as far as us bringing the gospel to the Lamanites. That that ship has sailed. Now, hopefully, we, if our hearts are close to God, I mean, there's nothing better than sharing the gospel with people, and that'll be part of all true believers. But as far as the prophecy goes, I'm looking for a man to rise up, a choice seer among the Lamanites themselves, to convince them of these words and to do a work among them. Well, hopefully he'll get on YouTube and listen to our podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the <laughs> guest, wouldn't it? Right, right. Or hear something about it, and who knows? Technology yeah, may know. be a very great part of that. I don't know. Well, we better uh, – oh, I don't want to go on too much farther. People are probably – we've been in an hour, so I guess we'll uh, – anything else to – sum up what we've talked about today um well l- let's let's read can we just read a couple more verses because i think sure. it kind of, there's kind of a breaking point there okay so it, it says neither will the lord god suffer that the gentiles shall forever remain in that awful state of woundedness which thou beholdest that they are in because of the plain and most precious parts of the gospel of the lamb which have been kept back by that abominable church whose formation thou hast seen wherefore saith the lamb of god i will be merciful unto the gentiles under the visiting of the remnant of the house of Israel in great judgment. And it came to pass that the angel of the Lord spake unto me, saying, Behold, saith the Lamb of God, after I have visited the remnant of the house of Israel, and this remnant of which I speak is the seed of thy father, wherefore after I have visited them in judgment and smitten them by the hand of the Gentiles, and after that the Gentiles do stumble exceedingly because of the most plain and precious parts of the gospel of the Lamb, which have been kept back by that abominable church, which is the mother of harlots, saith the Lamb, wherefore I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, saith the Lamb, insomuch that I will bring forth unto them in mine own power much of my gospel, which shall be plain and most precious, saith the Lamb. For behold, saith the Lamb, I will manifest myself unto thy seed, that they shall write many things which I shall minister unto them, which shall be plain and precious. And so I just love here that, that you know, here here's, here's a, Nephi 600 years or or so before Christ even came being told by God that his seed is going to write these scriptures down and and you know these the, the dealings of God with them and the covenants and then this his seed will be ministered to and that also the Gentiles which is you and me will be ministered to as well and then here we are fulfilling that prophecy by reading these words and receiving the truth found in the in this book, um, and you know, realizing that we have an opportunity to be a part of this same covenant by being adopted into this family, um, what a what a what a plain and precious truth uh, is found in in this story, and how how much hope that gives to us as as Gentiles. Yeah, well, the opportunity is there, plain, plain and precious. Um, but the prophecy goes on, and we'll find out what happens if, if and to those Gentiles that don't accept it, and encourage everybody to be those Gentiles that do, and treasure it up for what it is, separate it from tradition and doctrines of men, and look at what God has preserved for us, it's plainness. Anything yeah, think, else? Yeah, I just I think the key here is we have got to dig into this book and really learn the doctrine, really learn what it's teaching. You know, we have spent so much time trying to prove it to be true, trying to prove that, you know, with the Hebrew proofs and the geography and all these types of things, um, trying to prove that Joe Smith is a prophet and that we're not part of a cult and, you know, we're in the true church and, and all that. We spent so much time trying to prove that we totally missed these precious gems of, of scriptural truth that are being restored to our Bible uh, that were taken away through, through sin, through over time, we've missed those. And I, I think if, if we as a people would dig into this and really look at the doctrine, I think we would just find our savior and instead of, um, you know, instead of being groupies following the band, we'd actually know who the, who the band is, you know, know each individual person in, in the band. And um, I, I, when I read the Book of Mormon, it gives me so much joy, and it's so simple, and it it just sort of enlivens my soul. And I hope that uh, I hope that listeners will will 
take this challenge up to go through the Book of Mormon and try to find the doctrine of Christ, try to find Jesus in the Book of Mormon. Yeah, it does. You know, it doesn't take much digging because he's everywhere. Yep. All right. Until next, until next time, we're uh, be kind to one another. We're just walking each other home. And we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>